So welcome everyone to the Stanford Care Community Health Talk Series. Uh, today is Thursday, April 2022, April 14, 2022, and I'm Dr. Malaki Srinivasan, Associate Director of Stanford Care, the Center for Asian Health Research and Education. And I'm very pleased to introduce our good friend and colleague, Dr. Johan Profit, uh, who's going to talk to us today about health outcomes for Asian and Pacific Islander women and new ones. Uh, Dr. Uh, Profit is a professor of pediatrics and chief quality officer for the California Perinatal Quality Care Collaborative and director of the Perinatal Health Systems Research for the Department of Pediatrics. He is interested in the effect of a health system design on quality of care and outcomes for sick newborns and this includes healthcare delivery design at the macro system level, as well as organizational context at the hospital and the neonatal intensive care unit level. Um, he's been using this kind of information technology to support patients, families, care professionals, and policymakers to really be able to provide optimal care for sick infants. This is particularly important for Asian Americans since the health outcomes for uh, Asian American women and children in the perinatal setting is not really well known and well described. And he's gonna give us an update today on where we are with that information and what we can do from a policy perspective and a, from a community perspective to move forward. Um, Dr. Profit had uh, done his medical training in Germany. He had done his pediatric residency at Tufts University and his neonatal uh, fellowship and his master's in public health at Harvard. Um, he joins us today, I think, from Stanford. I'm not sure if he's traveling or not right now. And uh, we're very pleased to welcome him. And uh, before we get started, I do want to uh, thank our sponsors, uh, the Stanford Health Library, the Lane Library, and the Vincent Wu Foundation. And special thanks to Stanford Video for their ongoing uh, technology support. And with that, Dr. Profit, please uh, be welcome. And we're so looking forward to your comments. Thank you so much, Dr. Srinivasan. It's a real pleasure to be here tonight. I wish this was in a, in a little lecture hall or something where I could see everybody and not just stare into my computer, but we're also used to this by now. So what I was hoping to do today is uh, really take you a little bit on a whirlwind tour uh, across maybe like 10 years of uh, practice and research that we've been doing uh, in California. Uh, and, uh, and, and let you know a little bit about sort of health equity and general uh, perinatal, so maternal and, as well as neonatal uh, uh, work that we've been, we've been doing. Now, I'm a neonatologist, so uh, I'll be focusing a little more on the neonatal health outcomes, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll try to touch at least upon some of the maternal uh, health issues as well. Um, so... Uh, I first wanted to introduce the organization that I help lead uh, to you. It's called the uh, California Perinatal Quality Care Collaborative, and it's a real, a real gem here in the uh, uh, Bay Area and California uh, in, in general. So uh, this collaborative, which is a perinatal collaborative, which includes a neonatal group as well as a maternal group, uh, is really somewhat unique in the country and has been at the forefront of health improvements for mothers and newborns uh, throughout the country, if not in the world. Uh, we have very unique data sets, uh, and we're in a large state, so we have a benefit of actually getting data uh, across a large number of babies, which allows us to, to and mothers, which allows us to learn and, uh, and uh, uh, improve care in ways that uh, other states have not been able to. So we, uh, there's about 500,000 births uh, in California, and we, uh, through birth certificates and, and other means, receive data on all of those births. Uh, about 17,000 babies a year uh, are admitted to a newborn intensive care unit, and, and we receive uh, pretty granular data from more than 140 newborn intensive care units, and I don't have this on this slide, but it's about 250 maternity hospitals in the state, and, uh, 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 and nearly all of them, as well as, as uh, hospitals across the West Coast, all the way up to uh, Washington State, uh, provide data uh, to our data sets. Uh, babies uh, are sometimes transferred from one hospital to another hospital, and a very unique thing that we also have in California is that we can track these babies, and we know about the quality of the transport of these babies from one hospital to another. And then also uniquely, we're actually connected to uh, high-risk infant follow-up programs. It's really critical 
uh, to track what happens to babies after they have to have a stay in newborn intensive care unit. So a lot of the babies that we take care of uh, uh, in the newborn intensive care unit are premature babies, uh, but also a lot of babies, actually the vast majority of babies are larger babies, and many of them with uh, congenital anomalies or just babies that are generally sick uh, at the time of birth and require intensive care. So all of these data sets are linked, uh, which is really a unique uh, advantage we have. And then as an organization, what we do, uh, all of these hospitals are, are, are member institutions and we provide them with uh, essentially feedback reports and benchmarking reports so they can compare how they're doing uh, in relation to their peers and, and, and physicians and nurses are a bunch of competitive people. Uh, otherwise they probably never made it to uh, medical school in the first place. Uh, and they don't like to be kind of, uh, you know, not on the top of the heap. And so uh, just to, the motivation to see how you're doing compared to your peers is a big uh, uh, incentivizer for, uh, to improve care. Uh, we also bring hospitals together uh, in quality improvement collaboratives, uh, such that uh, hospitals learn from one another and how to, and uh, there's really a lot of sharing of expertise going on and uh, potentially better ways to, to uh, take care of mothers and, and newborns. We provide education throughout the state in various ways, through conferences, webinars, et cetera. Uh, and we also use the data uh, uh, and, uh, and the work that we do is sort of applied work with all of our other hospitals uh, to conduct research. Um, so really quite, a, quite an impressive uh, endeavor overall. And I'll show you a little bit more. This is kind of like one of the feedback reports that each hospital is can kind of see something similar to this. This is just for the neonatal outcomes. Something similar exists for, for maternal outcomes. And without going into too much detail, you can kind of see like, you know, if you're, if you're doing well in an, in an aspect of care that is green, that means you're kind of good. And if you're not doing so well in an aspect that's kind of red, that's, that's maybe not so good. And we provide you with trend data. And we provide you with all kinds of ways. Uh, I want to use like, like little icons here to delve a lot, dive a lot more into the details of these, these data items to kind of understand what's going on, where you're having, uh, where you're doing well, and where you're having challenges. Um, so, you know, and this is really something that's that is quite unique to this. Uh, uh, to our state. Uh, here's an example of uh, collaboratives that we've run. So these are sort of multi-centered. There's about 25 to 30 hospitals that typically participate uh, in, in these collaboratives. And here was one to reduce uh, uh, the number of antibiotics used. Antibiotics are good if you're using them for an infection, if you're using them if there's no infection, uh, if you're too generous when using them when, you know, when, when, when you actually don't need them, they can cause harm. Uh, and, uh, and so through this collaborative, we were actually able, for instance, it's just an example to, to, to uh, we were saving over almost 12,000 antibiotic days uh, within the state. Actually, outside of these, these particular NICUs that, that uh, did this collaborative, we then spread the learnings to the other hospitals and, and over like 50,000 uh, antibiotic days have been saved like sort of annually, just based on, based on those efforts. Um, we had another collaborative where we focus on healthcare associated infections. Those are obviously a big deal, especially if you're like a small, uh, uh, vulnerable preterm infant in a newborn intensive care unit. When you get an infection, you can get very sick, you can die from those. And uh, in, an, in, in the collaborative that we, we ran uh, through NICUs here, 20 NICUs, almost 19 participating in this collaborative, we reduced healthcare infections by over 75%. So, so really huge, huge. Um, improvements uh, through this kind of a collaborative improvement work. Here's an example of education. We've worked a lot on health equity, uh, really not just uh, uh, since the pandemic, but before, but here's kind of like one of the educational sessions that we held, uh, which was really focusing heavily on health equity. We have these, these every year, there's like a major kind of meeting uh, uh, that focuses on different topics. And, and, uh, and so we kind of bring the newest uh, information and learnings uh, to a wider community. And these are multidisciplinary learnings. It's not just physicians, you know, nurses, uh, respiratory care providers, uh, social workers, uh, many, many folks that really are required to make a difference uh, to our patients. Uh, and so here's been our impact uh, over the years. Uh, this is data from the CDC. Uh, in which uh, you can see that like, like uh, California actually was the only state in the, uh, in the nation that significantly decreased perinatal mortality uh, a number of years ago. And uh, 
um, actually California, and I don't have this slide here, but I just want to give a shout out to our maternal colleagues. Uh, you know, California has been the shining light really for reducing maternal mortality uh, in the country. Uh, and, and again, this, it's been the, the work of, uh, of the CMQCC, the Maternal Quality Collaborative, uh, that's been uh, it's been really the uh, kind of beacon you know, throughout the country on how to do this. And I'll show you a little bit of data uh, about that. So here are some other impacts uh, for, for our neonates. Uh, this is a paper uh, we published just a couple of years ago. It's about 10 years worth of data. So in this 10 years, uh, we've reduced mortality for very low birth weight infants by over 15%. And this is during a time where there was really no sort of new magic bullet being developed. Uh, through basic science or things like that. You know, there's there's some medicines that really seem to help a lot. Most of these were developed in the 70s and 80s, maybe early, like applied in the, in, in the 90s. But really over the last 20, 25 years, there hasn't really been a major kind of uh, technological advance uh, for these babies. So a lot of these improvements that I'm showing you are really just based on, on doing things better uh, in, in a more coordinated way. Uh, over 10% of babies, like a lot of you might have he heard, a lot of these small babies survive with disabilities. So an extra 10% of these babies, even though over time they get actually smaller, we're saving smaller and smaller, uh, younger and younger babies. They're surviving with less eye disease, less bowel disease, less lung disease, less brain disease. Um, so those are all good things. Uh, almost 50% uh, lower uh, rates of, of a terrifying disease of, of prematurity, which is called necrotizing enocolitis, uh, which is a terrible condition that, that can lead to death uh, or long-term disability. 20% uh, lower rates of brain hemorrhages, 40% uh, lower rates of surgery for eye disease, and, uh, and almost 45% uh, uh, reduction in, in infection rates. So massive improvements, really. In, uh, in, uh, in these are 2021 ratings, news, US News World Report, really five, like four of the top five ranked uh, neonatal uh, hospitals were all from California. So, you know, I think that sort of demonstrates the impact that, that we have had. And so, so, okay, how does this relate to health equity? Well, well, when we think of like quality of care, what we don't like is variation. In care, and 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 there's a lot of ways to to uh, get variation in care. One of the ways that we can find variation is we treat people differently, and so that that, that could be so health equity could be obviously an area where we might be treating patients differently. Now, uh, when we started this work, maybe about six seven years ago, uh, people really didn't believe that that was, was a thing. Like, you know, it's like we're treating everybody the same. They're all little babies. Everybody gets the same care. Um, there's, there's kind of like really uh, health inequity doesn't really exist in a hospital. What does exist is that, is that mothers experience pregnancies that are higher risk or lower risk. And uh, if they have more risk during pregnancy, then they're more likely to have a preterm baby and that baby might be in worse shape. Uh, because the pregnancy was more problematic. But once babies are born, it was sort of perceived that really the sort of like, you know, everybody was getting the same care. And so we were, we were kind of interested in this. And uh, before I tell you kind of more about health equity, I just wanted to, you know, obviously highlight that a lot of things have happened, uh, you know, in the last couple of years. And, and really with the COVID pandemic, uh, the, the kind of inequities in healthcare delivery have been really brought to the forefront, right? And so, so I mean, this has been most visible, of course, for, for Black and Latino patients who have been dying at much, much higher rates uh, than, than in white patients. Uh, but there's also been a real noticeable uptick uh, of uh, like outright racism against uh, Asian populations. And, uh, you know, when we, when we think about like, well, what might be happening in healthcare where we don't really like to see things like, like health inequities, there's always sort of the question of whether, you know, in the hospital, do we live in like a cocoon where we kind of live, like where we can put everything that sort of exists outside of uh, the healthcare system. We can shut that out. We can put it away and we just kind of like treat everybody the same. But, uh, you know, we're, the thing is that we're all influenced by the biases that we, we face every day in our lives. We face them in the news that we watch and the people we talk to, uh, the pictures we see. And so you might, you see this picture here and, you know, each one of you might have sort of a different thought about what this picture implies, right? There's a, 
like there's a different example I just wanted to show you here, which is from Google, uh, which kind of shows you how biases are really all around us and we're exposed to them and, and we may not be aware of them. So if you typed a couple of years ago, I think they've sort of tried to address this now, so you can check yourself if they're still true. But if you tried, uh, to, if you type three black teenagers and three white teenagers into Google, you would find these, these very different looking pictures, right? Or the three black teenagers, like these guys all look like they're, you know, so it's like mug shots or criminal shots. And the three white teenagers are sort of these happy-go-lucky, you know, playing sports, like happy teenagers. And so, you know, even like, like I'm going to just assume that Google didn't sort of build this algorithm intentionally, but this is kind of like what the algorithm shows us and what it, what it uh, uh, perpetuates to the people who, uh, you know, who, who use the, the platform. And so when we think of, uh, of health equity and, and health disparities, uh, essentially here's kind of sort of our framework for thinking about it. So there's a large part here uh, on the left, which is what is called social determinants of health. And those are all the things like poverty, income, healthy access to healthy foods and education, equal rights, maybe police, violence, uh, the ability for kids to play in parks uh, and transportation uh, availability. All of these things influence how healthy a pregnancy is. They influence the actually the, the epigenetic, uh, the, the expression of genes in patients, and those those that expression in moms of genes then actually also influences the health of pregnancy. Uh, so there's there's like we can trace these kind of stressors if these things are, are suboptimal. Uh, into uh, into genomes, uh, but whether it's through genomes or through other mechanisms, of course, uh, the, the the mom eventually uh, uh, gives birth at a hospital, and then once the, ba the baby is born, we would hope uh, that the baby receives equal care and hopefully good enough care that we get these like cute little babies. And they're born and they're healthy and they're, they're, they look wonderful and they can go home. But then also these babies will end up going home uh, and back into their environment. And that environment is, is, uh, is still kind of uh, uh, adverse. Um, you can imagine how long-term outcomes for, for babies might not be optimal. And so we were really kind of the first one to kind of try to focus here through the thing, like through the, like through the CPQCC and the CNQCC, what's happening here in the hospital. And so we looked at a literature. Uh, this is a study with Krista Sigurdsson in our, uh, in our lab that uh, did sort of a systematic review of the literature, scoured like hundreds of articles uh, and essentially categorized uh, articles that looked at disparities in, in, in the care of newborns into whether there, there were sort of structural differences in the hospitals where they were being uh, taken care of. And these are things like nurse staffing ratios and whether or not patients are born in inappropriate uh, 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 hospitals that can take care of certain kids that have certain, certain levels of needs. Uh, there are processes of care, whether we do certain things that we know work well, whether those are being done or not, and whether patients have different outcomes. And essentially, we found we found sort of evidence of disparities for all of these different areas in care, uh, kind of highlighting that indeed there is, is actually differential care is being given, um, which was kind of like a shock to people who mostly thought like, well, you know, we're we really give the same care to everybody. Well, if we just think about like, okay, like how might it be? What could be the mechanisms that we might give different care to different babies in the NICU? And so Elizabeth Howell actually uh, uh, was an obstetrician, used to uh, work at, at Mount Sinai in New York, is now at Penn. Uh, she she develops like a good framework and I think this still holds true and it holds true for really any race ethnicity. Uh, whether it's Asian, Black, Hispanic. Um, uh, essentially, like disparities can come about in two ways. Uh, first, we could segregate patients into hospitals that are just lower uh, performing. And they might not be lower performing because there's like bad hospitals. It might be that they get lower reimbursements. So it could be safety net hospitals. They don't get a lot of they don't have a lot of funds. They may not be able to have a, you know, a lot of nurses taking care of each patient, ancillary services that you need in a newborn intensive care unit, like lactation consultants or physical therapists and social workers, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, so, so, you know, by segregating vulnerable populations into those kind of facilities, you kind of ensure that you might, uh, you might get worse outcomes for those patients. Or you could be in a given hospital, like in my hospital, uh, and it could be that, uh, you know, whether we know it or not, and a lot of these things really are not sort of deliberate care like decisions, but, but we might give more preference to some patients over others. Uh, and, you know, we could call this interpersonal racism uh, versus the segregation is more like a structural racism kind of construct. And so here's an example for, for um, actually, this is both for, for uh, like a disparity within NICUs as well as disparities between NICUs. So here's data from California, where I'll walk you through this here a little bit. The, the measure that we're using here is called the baby monitor, which is a composite of NICU quality of care for small babies. These are very low birth weight babies, like uh, three pounds at birth and, and, and less. Um, so these babies are very vulnerable. They have a lot of like intensive care needs, uh, stay in NICU for a long period of time, sometimes months. And, uh, and there's sort of a number of different things that like a group of experts felt like all of these kind of individual measures represent kind of quality of care. And we put them together and then, and then we kind of like just show for each hospital uh, what their sort of composite score is. And so the better you farther you are here on the right, the better is your score. And the further you're on the left, the worse is your score. And each one of these is one newborn intensive care, is one hospital, each one of these lines. And the, uh, uh, what we're doing here on the on the y-axis is actually just showing a difference by race. And so we're showing the, the black babies here in the uh, red squares and white babies are in, in uh, the kind of blue diamonds. And so overall, what you can see is actually, well, it's not always a simple picture, isn't it? Because so there are some NICUs where essentially it's like almost the same, like whether you're like they're kind of this NICU is like middle of the road quality, in black and white patients essentially have just the same outcomes. And there's others where white babies seem to do a lot better. Oops, sorry. White babies seem to do a lot better uh, than, than black babies, even though this hospital is a really great hospital. It's one of the best in the, in the whole state. Um, and, uh, but you know, these babies here, these black babies do just about the same as these babies here in the, one of the worst hospitals uh, as long as you're black, but the white babies here are much, much worse outcomes than the white babies in this hospital. Overall, when we look, there's a lot more kind of like blue dots that are doing faring better uh, towards hospitals that, that perform better and more kind of um, red dots uh, in hospitals that overall perform worse. And when we do statistical measurements on those overall, uh, like if you're black, you tend to be uh, segregated, you're more likely to be taken care of in hospitals that don't perform as well overall. Here's another very complicated study, but essentially this is national data. This is data from the whole, the whole country, a similar organization to us, but uh, uh, and they have data, like we're sort of one state within you know the whole U US for, for this data set. And, and essentially like to make this a little bit easier, um, this is looking at whether or not patients get segregated into NICUs by race ethnicities. And if they were not, uh, then, then these different lines here should essentially all be along the dashed line here. These different lines here represent Asians in light blue and black patients in dark blue and, and Hispanic patients in, in orange. And so that the fact that they all like deviate pretty far from, from the diagonal line here, I mean that they are significant uh, segregation of these patients into hospital where we mostly take care of, uh, of them. Uh, here's an example uh, of within NICU differential care. And, uh, and here, uh, these investigators looked at uh, kangaroo care, uh, which is essentially uh, the picture of this mommy who's providing kangaroo care. It's a skin-to-skin -skin care of a baby on the mom's chest, the baby is nice and happy and, and receiving warmth and uh, is feeling uh, you know, really happy here with mom. Uh, now, if you don't speak the language, if you don't speak English, uh, you, it turns out within the single NICU, you're, 
you're going to be much less likely to uh, have kangaroo care time, even though uh, this is adjusted for for how many times patients visit it. So it's not it's not uh, that you know maybe if you don't speak English that like you you don't have the ability to be there as much. So this is uh, taken care of in the study. So uh, you know what's going on here likely. It's uh, that there's less communication between the nursing staff here and the, uh, and, and, and the families uh, because of a language barrier. And so, you know, there's, there's less, uh, less exchange of uh, uh, information around kangaroo care and uh, less uh, opportunity provided to, to do that. Uh, but we all treat all the patients the same, right? So whenever I give this talk to professionals, to doctors, that's usually what I what I hear. It's like they, well, we treat everybody the same. Well, uh, maybe we don't. So we actually asked folks uh, at one of the talks I gave, like, hey, you know, why don't you why don't you write us a little story whether or not you've experienced uh, disparate care in your NICU? And we asked families uh, and, uh, and, and and physicians and nurses. Uh, there was over 1,200 people at a, at a conference there. Over 300 of them uh, wrote us a story which, which included a, a disparity. And it was not all about race, ethnicity. A lot of it was about language. It was about class, uh, immigration status, et cetera. And essentially, when we analyzed these stories, there's sort of qualitative research to do this uh, methodology is you kind of analyze these stories for common themes. And you extract these common themes and and there were sort of four common themes. The fourth one is, is actually one that leads to maybe more privileged care. I'm not, I don't want to say better care because sometimes privileged care is actually not better care. Uh, but essentially, like there, there are some families that are really assertive and they receive priority treatment. There's sort of the VIP floor. So, you know, they get taken care of by the, by the uh, chief of staff or something like that. And it's, it's, not it's not always a good thing, <laughs> just, just by the way. But there's sort of this privilege that people... Uh, people uh, 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 have access to. Uh, but then there's there's kind of a, a number of ways in which uh, people may receive suboptimal care. And one of them is through what we, what we term neglectful care, which is where uh, the NICU staff ignore, avoid, or neglect family needs like breastfeeding or kangaroo care support uh, when it's considered just too difficult or unpleasant or there are some obstacles are too great to overcome. In the judgmental care, uh, is where staff evaluate the family's moral status based on race, class, immigration, et cetera, and circumstances uh, or behaviors are judged more harshly. And then discrimination occurs through staff attitudes or resource allocation. And finally, systemic barriers where staff was uh, unable or unwilling to address uh, um, barriers that families face, such as transportation or childcare, housing, uh, translation needs, or religious or cultural needs. I just wanted to give you a couple of examples of these. So here's a here's a story we got about neglectful care. Um, so just a general observation, when I worked as a charge nurse, nurses tended to just ignore parents who did not speak their language. Uh, often the use of a translator didn't occur daily for education and updates. These parents would have to sit by their baby's bedside and wonder how they were doing. Uh, these parents did not get the opportunity to interact and bond with the baby as a result. Here's another one. Uh, as an example of judgmental care. A micro premature infant born to new immigrant parents, lack of contact from parents and family, no phone calls or visits, uh, resulting in distress in the NICU about parents' attachment and concerns regarding ability or appropriateness in parenting. When approaching the family, they expressed surprise and expectation on them of inquiring of their baby as they came from a culture where a patient enters a hospital and they get a call to pick up the family member when the patient is discharged. Lack of understanding of a North American culture of parents' involvement in care. Uh, this was a neonatal nurse practitioner regarding a family that uh, uh, he or she identified as Asian. Now, what we didn't find is that anybody really wrote about giving uh, differential treatment to the babies directly. It was all really about how we treated families. So, um, you know, when I when I first kind of learned about health equity research, um, I was taken a like during this was doing my masters in public health studies. I was I was honestly I was like a little taken aback 
because I felt like I was hearing the same message over and over again. It's like, yeah, there's disparities, there's disparities, the poor are doing worse and, than the wealthy. And, you know, it's always a kind of the same message. And there was never anything about like trying to address it. And so initially when we sort of embarked on this, I was kind of hesitant to really embark on it because like, I just don't want to just, just document, document, document disparities. I want to do something about them if you do. And so being part of this quality improvement organization really, I feel like has, has sort of paved the way for me to, to really engage in this in a way that, uh, at least to me, has been sort of transformational because because I don't only have to talk about how how there's problems, but we can kind of work on solutions. And so along the kind of things that we do as an organization, I'm just showing you a couple of examples, and there's more, but I'm showing you a couple of things in which we're trying to kind of really address. Uh, uh, health disparities. And so um, uh, the first was like I told you about audit and feedback, which is like measurement, essentially quality measurement and, and, and feeding it back to providers and benchmarking. And so we've been working because family-centered care was, so, it was like such a key, key pathway of, uh, of disparate care. We're developing measures of family-centered care such that hospitals can, can improve what they do with regard to family-centered care. Um, we've worked on the whole equity dashboard and, and got an uh, NIH grant. So each of our NICUs, I'll show you the example, can actually uh, um, uh, look how their NICU is performing with regard to health equity. Uh, we formed a health equity committee. Uh, we get over 100 volunteer hours in a network from, from providers from all across the state. And so some of those uh, have formed together a, a health equity committee in which we directly try to address like the you know the main sources like interpersonal racism or structural racism and we've put put out a uh, NIH grant to hopefully get funding for that um, and specifically we would love to conduct actually a collaborative uh, of hospitals that particularly serve the poor uh, because they typically don't or they can participate in a collaborative because they just lack the funds, uh, even though those funds are actually quite low, but they lack sometimes the, the funds to even for a couple of thousand dollars to participate in those. And so uh, we've submitted another grant to the National Institute of Health to, to hopefully uh, help us address that. And uh, whenever we do a quality improvement collaborative currently, we make sure we include equity aims so that we, uh, because there is a possibility that as you try to improve quality to actually make, make uh, equity worse because sometimes the most benefits uh, flow naturally to to sort of the wealthiest uh, uh, patient populations first. Uh, we focus strongly on patient education and various conferences. I showed you an example of that already. We've created sort of tip sheets for what uh, uh, hospitals could do right away. We've worked with parents. Uh, we always work closely with parents. And I invite you, if you're interested in any of the work that we're doing and want to participate, please contact me uh, because we, we really appreciate uh, working with folks who have direct lived experience of, uh, of the things that we try to improve. Uh, and then finally, we, we conduct uh, a fair bit of research. And so one of the kind of new endeavors that we're, uh, that we're, we've been dipping into is, is to look at the uh, Asian American, uh, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islander populations. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So there you go. So here's just an example of our family centered care focus board. Uh, so this, like you know, this is a sort of hot off the press here, April, April 2022. So now NICUs uh, can look specifically how they're doing, and they can di dive again deeper into all of these metrics and see, you know, how how are we faring with things like skin to skin kangaroo care or or giving early breast milk, uh, uh, etc. Um, so this is happening. Here's an example of our health equity dashboard uh, where NICUs can see kind of where they have challenges. Uh, that they may want to address here in red, and I, I'll focus on one here for you because I figured you may have an interest in like Asian populations uh, who have about almost three times the rate of, of uh, severe eye disease um, as, uh, as as black uh, patients, and you know so so these are things that previously were like totally invisible to our providers. They just you know they, they wouldn't really know, and now they can kind of see where there's. Uh, potential opportunities for for them to improve. Here, Asian populations are actually doing really well with human milk nutrition, but I'll show you some data later. It's not uni universally true uh, amongst different Asian subpopulations. Um, and so, you know, there's so there's there's a lot of different ways that uh, our providers can uh, learn about what's going on in the NICU. Uh, here's the example from our 
uh, improvement committees and, and uh, OB colleagues are focusing on, on respectful care. Uh, they have a number of efforts going on. We're working on family empowerment, uh, education. We're working with these safety net NICUs that are, that are uh, really principally taking care of the poor. Uh, we're working on, on better ways to transition babies back into home and then to a high risk infant follow up program. We're also uh, looking at, uh, at at ways to like better serve uh, populations that face challenges when they go back into their communities. Uh, particularly during during COVID, as you can imagine, uh, there was a lot of difficulty in in bringing and following patients up over time. So a lot of it had to be done through telehealth, et cetera. Telehealth is not available to everybody. Here's a tip sheet we developed with parents uh, on how to provide better family-centered care. Here's a here's a whole framework for institutional change we provided, where we there's a lot of detail in this that, that providers can can access and and kind of follow up on. These are just initial ideas, but there's just ways for, for hospitals to get started. Uh, here's some of the research we've done. Here's an example from the uh, 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 maternal collaborative. This is uh, Elliot Main, uh, who's the lead leader in that. So uh, severe maternal morbidity is, is, a, is a kind of a composite outcome of, of bad things that happen to moms when, when they go into labor. And the main thing, uh, for maternal morbidity is, is maternal hemorrhage. So excessive bleeding at the time of birth. And some, some moms die from excessive hemorrhage. And uh, in, before uh, the collaborative did sort of a statewide, or the, you know, the maternal side did a statewide improvement collaborative, you can see the, the sort of average uh, rate here was about 22%. Uh, percent. And after the collaborative, it was, was decreased to about 18.6. And these red lines here are sort of like they're called control limits, essentially, uh, like looking at the random variation around, around these all these individual points. So, so this already is highly, highly successful. Mainly what they did here really is, um, is they, they uh, provided each hospital uh, with what's called a, a sort of standard approach uh, to treating and monitoring blood loss and treating blood loss, diagnosing it early, responding quickly. And there's like a physical kind of hemorrhage cart now essentially in every, in every uh, labor and delivery floor uh, where rather than having to run to the blood bank to get blood, there's something right there that can be accessed if a mom is heavily bleeding uh, to, to help and save her. And this sort of very technical approach um, you know, that have nothing to do actually with any sort of health equity training or bias training or any of those things, uh, essentially eliminated the existing disparities in, in severe maternal morbidity uh, in between black and, and, and non-black, like here, you know, white, white patients. And so here in this chart, you can see, see before at baseline, before the intervention, these were the rates by race ethnicity. So, so white and black and Asian, and uh, so it's black was 28.6 and then whites was 19.8. And after the improvement collaborative, uh, you know, it, it decreased somewhat for, for white patients, but it decreased substantially for, for black patients. It's still a little bit higher, you could argue, but you know, this is no longer statistically significant. Uh, you know, so, so it's, you know, while it's a little bit higher, it's almost the same at this, at this stage. <coughs> and so, you know, interestingly enough, apologize. Interestingly enough, like a, a very kind of technical approach really led to an eradication of uh, of a, a, a disparity. Now that might not work for everything, but it kind of falls into this sort of quality improvement, care standardization kind of paradigm that that we as an organization excel in. Uh, so, what about uh, A and HPI populations? Well. Uh, and these slides uh, I, I stole, they're courtesy of uh, Dr. Palanyapan, who's uh, the director of the, uh, uh, of the Stanford Center for Asian Health Research and, and, and Education. So thank you to her. I think these are terrific slides. So uh, Asian, uh, Asians represent 60% uh, of the population of the globe, right? and over a huge uh, span of the earth. Uh, 6% of the US, but it's the fastest rising population, actually, uh, immigrant population in the US. Uh, and in, in the Bay Area, it's about 
So you know, maybe maybe sort of the, one of the large, like California and then the West Coast are the largest uh, population uh, of uh, ANHPIs, and uh, and therefore maybe like the perfect place to kind of study them. But you know what it means when you come from a large portion of the globe is that these populations are actually hugely heterogeneous. But in almost all studies, uh, they're just kind of you know, reported as like one group, right? Asians. But what does it mean? It's like many, many, many cultures, over 30 countries, different lifestyle, different pregnancy, birth, and, and care behaviors. Uh, and, and, you know, some of which, depending on when people immigrated, may have been modified through acculturation um, because of life in the United States. And so this like really highly, this a highly heterogeneous group, it varies profoundly also in, in characteristics such as whether people speak English or their socioeconomic status, whether they have health insurance coverage, their beliefs about health and about the use of health services, their diets, um, their, their, their body mass index and their, and their lifestyles. And so, you know, really, like, we shouldn't treat this group as like one group. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, even worse, uh, this like large group and rising group uh, really only receives about 0.2% of funding from the National Institute of Health. Like research on these populations only receives just a tiny fraction uh, of NIH funding. And so we, we really wanted to, to uh, like understand this population better because this is a population we serve. Uh, here in California, and we don't know enough ab ab about them. Um, in principle, when we do comparisons with, with, with aggregated uh, like Asians as one group, they tend to do pretty well, relatively similar to you know white populations. And so, is there really a problem? Well, I think the, the, the population is so heterogeneous. Unless we look, we're not going to know. And so we proposed to study to the National Institute of Health to really study mothers and, and their newborns uh, and to really try to disaggregate all of these different populations to understand uh, you know, what, what types of populations face what barriers and uh, uh, how we can work uh, in partnership with these populations to understand um, their practices, uh, their their preferences, uh, to and then ultimately to find solutions, uh, like we try to do for other areas of health equity, uh, so that we can optimize care for for each one of the uh, populations, um, A and HPI populations in California. So I hope that makes sense. Um, this is uh, the study brings together a, a collaborative group, not just from Stanford, but also from UCSF and CMQCC, CPQCC, both, both uh, located uh, at Stanford. Uh, we kicked off our, our research just a couple of months ago uh, in May with a with a conference. It was also funded by by Kia, so thank you, thank you very much again. Um, and it was really a fascinating. Uh, fascinating introduction into uh, into this uh, landscape of research because even on the, this first day where we just kind of presented sort of very basic data, we learned a lot already from different panels of of patients and representatives uh, from across the state and from from many many different groups. And so, really, this sort of created the first platform for us to 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 understand uh, what the needs are. Uh, what the pain points are, and maybe how we can how we can uh, work together uh, in partnership with these groups to uh, to better understand the barriers and then eventually solve them. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of, uh, 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 of like an introduction into into the uh, moms and, and newborns that are of the A and HPI in California. Uh, this is very early work. Um, you know, this this talk is maybe coming like three four years too early, so we'll we'll still need to do a lot more work. But I'll show you some preliminary data, and you can kind of get a sense of the kind of things that we'd be interested in. So uh, here here are deliveries uh, in California. You can see there's about 133,000 uh, total, 16% uh, of the, the total in California, and you can kind of see the the largest groups here. 
right? And uh, you know, I can show you this as a pie chart as well. So about 27% Chinese, Asian Indian, 17, Filipino, 15, et cetera, et cetera, right? Got some just smaller groups. Uh, and then there's also some interesting groups that are actually Asian multiple. This is typically all based on the, on the mom and the birth certificate and whatever the mom says that her uh, heritage is. Um, like oftentimes on birth certificates, the paternal heritage is, is, is missing. Uh, and so, so we typically, when we do these studies, we focus first on, on whatever the mom provides. Uh, we can look at like where where moms are born, and you know, here are the native Hawaiians. Obviously, almost all of them are born in the U.S., right? right? Because Hawaii is part of the U.S., uh, quite obviously. Uh, you all know that, but like, you know, here's another group: Asian Indians. Only about eleven percent uh, of these patients are actually born uh, in the U.S., and most of them immigrants. And you can kind of you can kind of see the distribution here and understand that you know maybe many of them might not speak English very well. And, and might face quite a few, few uh, uh, barriers in, in accessing the health care, you know, interacting with the health care system. Uh, here's maternal education level. Maternal education level is a very strong predictor of, of, uh, of health and health outcomes, uh, people's ability to navigate the health care system. And so this is a bachelor degree or higher, and you can see very highly educated groups. Uh, over here, and then and then you know groups that are that have lower levels of education, uh, and thus may for, may face more more health risks. So really variable, right? So important. Essentially, all of these slides are showing that like just calling all of these groups just Asian as one thing just really doesn't make sense at all. Here's preterm birth. Uh, now black women. Uh, have much higher rates of preterm birth, which is the primary reason why infant mortality for black babies is much higher. You can see here that the Filipino moms actually have even higher preterm birth rates, born in less than 37 weeks, than, than black moms in California. Uh, and there's other groups who are really quite challenged, Cambodians and Laotians, also have very high preterm birth rates. You don't understand why? This is, is it, again, this is just sort of preliminary data. Other groups, more like along the lines of, uh, you know, so European uh, countries, but even, even white moms in the US have, have much higher rates of preterm birth than, than compared to Europe, Australia, uh, other Western countries. Uh, here are very low birth weight infants. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, similarly to, to the, the distribution is going to be sort of relatively similar when we think to, to the moms, but you know, here actually you've got Filipinos higher, like remember they also had higher rates of preterm, or we see this again for not just less than 37 weeks, but we always see it for less than 1500 grams. These are really much smaller babies than 37. These are more like 32 weeks and below babies usually. And then uh, uh, Asian Indians also, uh, more than the Chinese, which which uh, you, you you might have thought uh, from the prior data that I show you, you would find more frequently. So some of the things we we don't understand quite why this is. Here, are how many babies are small? They're they're born small and early, but how many of those are even born really small, just for their gestational age? So they're you know they're, they're less than the tenth percentile for where they were supposed to be even though they're born, already born small. And, you know, so in, and we see this in a number of studies here that there's a really high um, proportion of uh, Asian Indians uh, tend to have babies that are kind of smaller than the 10th percentile. Uh, and, and again, not quite sure. Similarly here, native Hawaiians and, and Filipino, again, uh, relatively high rates, uh, also Japanese. Uh, these are, this is an outcome uh, of newborn care, which is called chronic lung disease. Essentially, these are babies that need, need a ventilator or oxygen for a long period of time. And here we have Korean babies with a, quite a high rate, and it's really unclear why that is. Native Hawaiians are quite a good outcome here. Asian Indians, quite a good outcome. So you can see there's like really quite a bit of variability. 
Breast milk at discharge, this is something we can really, we've really learned to, to, to uh, affect this outcome uh, and improve it over time. You can see great rates here of, of uh, feeding at discharge for Japanese and Korean. But other Pacific Islanders, so these are the non-Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, really quite, quite low rates um, uh, and, and, and very challenged. And really, this could be an area where we could, where we, where we could address. Uh, in hospital survival, it looks pretty good for everybody here, like, uh, you know, between 90 and 95% for these babies that are born at least, you know, about like eight weeks too early. So that's, that's really good. Now, I could have shown you this in mortality, and then I would have shown you, you know, maybe 10% mortality and 5% mortality. And I could have told you that, like, you know, other Pacific Islanders have twice the mortality uh, of the, uh, uh, you know, of the Koreans and the Filipino babies. Um, so I could have made it look worse and maybe more sens sensationalistic. But the fact that nine, like 90 to 95 percent of the babies survive is, I think, something to probably celebrate a little bit. Okay, so in summary, uh, the NICU is not a social cocoon. Uh, racism in the NICU does exist, and we need to just face it and address it. Uh, most efforts have been focused on Black and Hispanic populations, but really uh, the NAA. NHPI uh, group is, is, is very, very heterogeneous and it deserves our attention because there's areas where we can uh, uh, improve quite a bit. And I just wanna finish with this quote from Martin Luther King Jr., which is that of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. And with this, I just wanna thank you show your faces of all the wonderful people that work with us uh, at CPQCC, make all of this work happen and uh, invite you to uh, join the discussion and conversation. Uh, Dr. Prophet, I can't thank you enough. The, the such a wonderful talk. And uh, I really appreciate how you took us through uh, the entire thought processes of where the field of neonatal ICU care, newborn care is moved us into structural racism and interpersonal racism, presented the data for the health equity dashboards, which is such a, a, an amazing contribution and really showed us how data can bend the curve in terms of a maternal fetal complications and what, what an, a remarkable set of achievements. Um, uh, we're so grateful to you that you've now turned your attention to uh, Asian disaggregated populations. And uh, hopefully this grant uh, through the NIH, this multi-center study gets funded. Um, I did wanna ask you a few questions in regards to uh, the influence of nativity and the influence of um, culturally appropriate care. Uh, I think that this is a, a major problem that a lot of the uh, patients, especially who are from refugee populations or who are from some of the underserved Southeast Asian communities uh, are facing. Um, even before this grant is funded, how would you recommend physicians and patients and families and communities support these communities who clearly are doing much worse? Um. Do you mean on the, on an individual basis, or from the healthcare provider, or from the? I I, I would say, but so the first would be from the healthcare system perspective, yeah. um, which I think involves both the delivery of care and the education of the providers. Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, I think we need to make sure that the providers uh, that the patients understand us, and uh, and so I think you know, and, and maybe that's not all, like always done that we actually actually. You know, first of all, ask whether people understand what we say, and not just whether they understand what we say, but whether they really comprehend what we say. Uh, because you know, and, uh, and we we also need to be a little humble and, and ask whether what we may may recommend is appropriate to their to their cultural uh, background. So th there's one example that comes to mind that one of our, our patient representatives told us about at the conference, she said, well, after she had a, a baby, um, you know, one of the nurses came in and brought this like huge, like cup of ice water. And, you know, her, her thought was like, you know, I, I, I don't want the ice water because in my culture, like I'm not supposed to drink something cold right now. It's kind of like, you know, so it felt a little offensive. It was like a minor thing. 
you know, but you know, there's there's a sort of these level of communications that are just not quite there. And people don't really ask. And because they don't ask, they don't know. And and when you're a patient, you it's difficult because you don't always want to sort of, you know, you don't want to like kind of piss off your care team by being sort of, oh, I'm gonna be the difficult patient that's gonna like, you know, say X, X, Y, and Z. But I think you you need to um, like, you know, you, you should, if you have trouble speaking the language, you should always ask and you always have the right to ask for an interpreter. You should mm -hmm. absolutely do that. Um, I always recommend to our patients to write everything down. Uh, any questions they have, any day we come by in rounds, they want to kind of see their the piece of paper with the questions on it because they'll forget as soon as we we walk and we you know we do rounds and they hear 150 different things about their baby. Uh, and then we we always have, like try to like teach them and have them teach us back you know, so that we make sure that whatever we said they understood. We actually try to make patients part of our rounds. Uh, and we ask, like we, you know, we go to the nurse, we ask what the nurse thinks about, you know, there's a sort of a process, the respiratory therapist, uh, and uh, we'll ask the family if there's, is there anything that you would like us to do different, or is there anything that you would like us to stop doing, so that they kind of become used to after doing this every morning when they can be there, uh, that they're sort of part of the team and feel like they're part of the team and that their input is valued. But it's a it's a journey that doesn't come, you know, it doesn't happen from one day to the next. Uh, so I think patients need to, you know, they need to know their rights, and they they should feel free to express what what they need, and and what works and what doesn't work for them. Because I think ultimately, as physicians, we want things for our patients that work for them. Because if we just tell them to do things that they're not going to end up doing. It doesn't really help anybody. So yeah, I'll leave it at that. A long yeah. limit answer. Uh, well, Dr. Prophet, I, I can't thank you enough. This is such a, an amazing talk. It's very eye-opening, I think, for most of us in the audience who are not familiar with uh, neonatal care and some of these uh, very disturbing figures. Um, uh, your work is groundbreaking. And again, uh, as a community, I think we're very grateful to you. So on behalf of Stanford Care, I want to thank you again for coming and presenting and uh, thank uh, all of our participants today. There's a whole series of questions into chat and uh, we'll probably uh, send them to you and uh, post them perhaps a little bit later oh with uh, your permission. Um, I'd also like to thank again the Stanford Library for funding uh, this series along with the Vincent Wu Foundation and uh, Stanford Video for their uh, wonderful technical support. Um, I would like to also uh, let our community know that the next Stanford Community Healthcare Talk will be on September 20th on how Nourish is giving Asians the tools to eat well and live well with Dr. Uh, Minal uh, Mohirer. Uh, and this is actually a really wonderful project that is on Facebook uh, where there's culturally appropriate and curated diabetic foods that are being made. Uh, that uh, highlight how you can translate um, the diabetic recommendations for better food practices uh, into the traditionally very carb heavy Asian diets. So uh, Dr. Prophet, again, thank you very much and our audience uh, and our community. Uh, thank you for coming and being such active participants. We'll make sure these questions get answered and post them as part of the video. Thank you, it was my pleasure. <laughs>